tonight on CBC Vancouver News. In my heart, I was praying, you know, all the people who affected. BC's Sri Lankan community remembers victims of the deadly Easter Sunday bombings. Also, recognize this SUV? Police say it's linked to a deadly shooting in Kitsilano and... It's going to be kind of confusing, I think, but I mean, why not? Like your crosswalks scrambled? Coming to Vancouver intersections this summer. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We are learning more tonight about the man who was shot and killed in his parked car last week in Kitsilano. The distraught family and friends of 30-year-old Manaj Kumar believe he was mistakenly targeted. Vancouver police say Kumar wasn't known to them. And as the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, they have a new lead tonight in the killing. Flowers wrap around a light pole close to where Minaj Kumar was shot to death on Tuesday night. Friends say the 30-year-old was leaving work at a hideaway eatery where he was a chef, a job he had just started a few weeks ago. Friends say he normally called his spouse from the car before heading home. But that night, police found him sitting in the silver BMW, the headlights still on, and 10 bullet holes through the car. We've got a one vehicle in a busy area. We've got one person in a vehicle. We've got a number of shots that have been fired directly into that vehicle. Uh, so that leads us to believe that it's targeted. Police say Kumar was not known to them, and his friends and family say he had absolutely no ties to gangs and that the shooting was a case of mistaken identity. Investigators can't say what the motive was behind the shooting, but they now have a vehicle of interest. This white Dodge Durango with an older style roof rack. Witnesses reported seeing a car flee the area after the shooting, and hours later, police were called to a second incident. The car was found here on West 22nd between Arbutus and U Street on the night of the shooting. It had been set on fire, and firefighters were called to put out the flames just before midnight. Lighting a vehicle on fire does pose certain challenges for the police, but we also have other uh, tools in our tool belt that may allow us to pull evidence from that. So we're not going to rule anything out. We're going to go over it with a fine tooth comb. Police are also asking anyone with dash cam video from the night of the shooting to call them, especially if they were driving in the Kitsilano or Arbutus areas of the city between 7.30 and 9.30 p.m. It's been almost a week since the shooting, but still no arrests, just heartache for friends and family who say it was a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. People are starting to gather in Surrey tonight to remember the 290 victims of the deadly Easter Sunday bombings in Sri Lanka. We'll go there live to the vigil in just a minute. First, as Paul Hunter reports, police have arrested two dozen members of a local militant group suspected of carrying out those attacks at churches and hotels. In Sri Lanka's capital today, more explosions as three bombs found in a van near one of the churches hit yesterday blew up as police tried to defuse them. No one was hurt. It ratcheted up tensions in a country still reeling from yesterday's attacks that left so many dead and wounded. Even as police elsewhere found dozens of detonators, no one can yet say with certainty who's behind it. Neither ISIS nor Al-Qaeda has claimed responsibility. About everything. Today, the government pointed to a Muslim group called National Tawfiq Jamaat. The suicide bombers are said to have all been members. This is a local uh, organization, but we don't know whether they have been linked to the outside. In Washington, U.S. officials were more pointed. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said this was America's fight, too, as he called for those behind the bombings to be brought to justice. Uh, what was supposed to be a joyful Easter Sunday was marred by a horrific wave of Islamic radical terror uh, bloodshed. As the sad task of identifying bodies continued in Colombo, police have now been given broad powers to arrest and detain suspects. As the country stands in fear, more violence may loom. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. As mentioned, the local Sri Lankan community is gathering tonight for a vigil for the victims of the bombings. The CBC's Eva Yiguin Senj is live in Surrey. So, Eva, how's the community dealing with the aftermath of those attacks? 
Mike, shock and heartbreak have been the overwhelming responses to the tragic news as local Sri Lankans watch the news coming out of Colombo. Some are still waiting to find out if family members are among the victims. It's uh, very upsetting, but I pray for the family and loved ones. Uh, you know, we don't know who actually died so far. Angela Nalia and her husband stayed up late Saturday night waiting for more news of the attacks in Colombo. Both of them grew up in Sri Lanka. The bombings hit close to home. I've been attended those church when my child during my childhood. Her husband waits for news from his cousin. My cousin, uh, my dad's brother's son, he's the uh, general manager of Grand Cinnamon. That's the hotel that got bombed uh, by an uh, occupant who had tied the bomb to his chest, and uh, and I hope he's okay. Happy no, I won't. Many of the explosions also occurred at Christian churches. UBC's Sri Lankan Student Association said the attacks must be condemned regardless of religious or political affiliations. And given the scope of the attack, I wouldn't be surprised if there's other members of the Sri Lankan diaspora in BC who have been directly affected. For now, most communication has been cut off because of a block on social media by Sri Lankan authorities. Families in the Lower Mainland are still waiting to hear news from their loved ones. And Eva, what's uh, planned for tonight's vigil there? Well, Sri Lankans of different religious and ethnic backgrounds are gathering here at Holland Park in Surrey to show love and support for those back home. They'll be reciting, uh, they'll be uh, observing a few moments of silence and religious leaders will be reciting some prayers. Organizers say they want to show a message of unity and solidarity against hatred. The message would be clear to the people that we, we would stand in peace together to defeat violence. Violence has no place in our society. It's zero tolerance and, and the message will be very clear that peace will overcome violence. Tonight's vigil is set to begin soon. A second vigil will be held tomorrow night also here at Holland Park for Sri Lankan Christians. Back to you, Mike. Thanks, Eva. Live in Surrey tonight. Well, fencing has gone up around Sunset Beach Park a day after staff finished cleaning it up following the unpermitted 420 festival. The fence only surrounds the lower flat portion of the park. We asked the city for comment, but staff say the park is currently under assessment. The city says it'll provide an update on the next steps for the field tomorrow. The city of Vancouver has reached a settlement with the owners of two SROs that were in violation of city bylaws. The Sahota family, owners of the Balmoral and Region Hotels, pleaded guilty to the majority of charges against them mostly related to the upkeep of the two buildings. At one point, the Region Hotel had more than 1,000 open bylaw safety and maintenance violations. Both buildings have been declared unsafe by the city and closed. The Sahotas have agreed to pay a fine of $150,000 and make $25,000 in charitable donations. It's an amount the city says is not enough. Staff say in a statement, the legal avenues that were available to the city prosecutor were limited, and we recognize that the value of the resolution does not reflect the historic harm done to downtown Eastside residents and the community through the unsafe conditions of these two buildings. The city is attempting to expropriate both properties from the Sahotas. That process is separate from this settlement and is still ongoing. Well, get ready. To scramble, this summer, pedestrians in Vancouver will be testing a unique way to get across the street. They're called scramble intersections. As Rafferty Baker reports, eight years after the city pledged to bring them in, the white paint is finally going down. Pedestrian scrambles are also known as diagonal crossings. People wait their turn to walk, and then they all get to go at once in every direction. I don't see why anybody would be against it. Is there any objections? I mean, it's going to be kind of confusing, I think, but I mean, why not? I guess in that way, the uh, traffic goes a little bit uh, faster, maybe. Because everyone knows that once they can go, they can go any direction, and the cars all know they've got to stop. Vancouver city officials prefer the name All Walk, and about eight years after saying they were going to try them out within a year, two intersections have been selected to get the scramble treatment. Both intersections are next to the pedestrian-only Robson Square. 
They're both T-shaped with one-way streets. So why the long wait for something that seems pretty straightforward? It's not like we haven't been making, you know, any improvements for, you know, pedestrian safety. You know, we, we have been doing uh, a lot of work uh, all throughout our city, you know, looking at signal timings at, at our intersection, installing new crosswalks. Chow says other intersections that were being considered, busy spots like Broadway and Camby or Maine and Hastings, just weren't suitable. Both are on major public transit routes, and Chow says they would slow down buses. And scrambles aren't necessarily faster overall, it's more of a pedestrian safety thing. I think it's important to also recognize the scramble. Yes, it does reduce the conflicts when pedestrians are moving, but they also need to wait longer to cross the street because they have to wait for the entire cycle for you know the, the vehicle, both vehicle movements to go in the north-south and the east-west and all the turn phases as well. Chow says the new scrambles should be in place by about July. And once the Broadway subway goes in, some of the other intersections could be reconsidered. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. An Earth Day protest disrupted downtown Victoria this afternoon as people marched down Douglas Street. Protesters shut down several blocks for a couple of hours. They want Canada's major banks to divest from fossil fuels and reinvest in clean energy. Meanwhile, for his part, Premier John Horgan says unprecedented wildfires and floods in B.C. have made climate change all too clear. He's urging people to work together toward a cleaner, more sustainable future. Well, speaking of sustainable futures, federal Green Party leader Elizabeth May got married today in a typical eco-friendly fashion. Flowers for the ceremony were reused from Easter Sunday and guests were shuttled in using electric vehicles. Among those attending, some high-profile guests. It was such a wonderful, um, wonderful event. It had lots of love, lots of um, joy, people clapping, cheering. It was very exciting. Well, my husband, uh, Tim, and I came here to, to celebrate with Elizabeth and, and John. It's a, it's a happy day and it was an extraordinarily beautiful ceremony. She looked fantastic. The newlyweds actually discouraged some friends and family from flying in for the wedding, all in order to reduce the amount of travel and lower greenhouse gas emissions. May and her husband, John Kidder, will make their way across the country by train to hold receptions with friends in Toronto and Ottawa. Brett Sauter home is here now with our first look at the forecast. And Brett, we actually had a couple of earthquakes in the region today. Yeah, you're quite right. Now, I know this normally doesn't fall into the realm of meteorology, but as a resident seismologist for the day, at least, wanted to mention that we had two earthquakes off the coast of western Vancouver Island. The first one was a 4.6 magnitude at uh, approximately 1.37 in the afternoon, and this was followed by a 4.9 magnitude uh, in roughly the exact same location. Now, the latter one was actually discovered, or felt rather, by a resident in Winter Harbor. Otherwise, there was no damage reported here. Now, in terms of weather, throughout the day today, we just had a few spotty showers going across the region and I've got some good news because this is honestly about as bad as it's going to be for the entire week so we have a really nice week forecast ahead and in terms of current temperatures where we're sitting at right now anywhere between 9 and 10 a little bit on the chilly side even around me outside of the CBC studio it's a bit on the cool side but temperatures will get up into the mid-teens by this week all right Brett thanks we'll talk to you in a bit sounds good well imagine your credit and debit card information being shared with other companies by your bank without you knowing it. Coming up, a BC woman is going public, raising serious questions about security and privacy. Six thirteen on this Easter Monday night. Thanks for watching us on uh, Facebook tonight. Well, uh, an estimated 100,000 people gathered at the beach to mark 420 this past weekend. The annual celebration of all things cannabis. As our Matthew Black tells us, the annual cleanup efforts that follow the event come with calls for a new venue. Three, two, one! Happy 420! It was a cannabis celebration, and the day after 420, Sunset Beach went from this to this. City crews and West End residents all helping with the cleanup. 
a lot of food containers, I'd have to say. A lot of drinks containers, pizza boxes, that sort of a thing. Leftover edibles and other garbage, a concern for park goers. With anybody who brings a dog down, it's, it's a huge, huge issue. Some dogs, especially the smaller ones, I mean, uh, potentially they could go into shock or even die if they, they eat it. A hundred thousand people passed through yesterday, but all things considered, the park is in decent shape. A far cry from a year ago when wet weather turned the grass into mud, forcing part of the park to close for 10 weeks while the city restored the sod. Uh, I noticed that it's somewhat better than it has been in the past. But better isn't good enough for some in the West End who'd like to see the event move elsewhere. If they want to hold this event, hold it out in a park or, or uh, in a farm, somewhere way out where it doesn't not going to bother people. This is right in the town. This is right in our community. Police say there were only a handful of minor incidents yesterday, including 14 medical emergencies. Organizers point to that as proof the event should stay put. Well, there seems to be a huge double standard when it comes to marijuana events or 420 itself. You know, we have a lot of events here in the city and a lot of them do a serious amount of damage. The park board says it's inspecting the field and will figure out what work needs to be done in the coming days. Matthew Black, CBC News, Vancouver. And you can read more about the event on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And a reminder for you, because of hockey tomorrow night, our television newscast will be delayed. If everything ends on time between Boston and Toronto, we'll likely be on at about 7 o'clock. If you can't wait until then, we'll be live at our usual time on YouTube and Facebook, CBC Gem, and online at 6 o'clock. Stay tuned. Back with more news in just a few moments. woman is going public tonight after learning her credit and debit card information was being shared without her knowledge. Their cards have what's called an updating service. It allows information about your account numbers and expiry dates to be shared with other companies. And as Rosa Marcatelli explains, it's raising serious questions about privacy and security. I don't like information of mine being given around without me even being aware of it. One call after another. They said that they didn't give that information out to PayPal. No one, not her bank, credit card company, nor PayPal, could or would explain how PayPal got her new expiry date on her Visa debit card when she didn't want the company to have it. It's a debit card that can be used for online purchases. They seem very confused at first. Last month, PayPal emailed Ancuna asking her to update the card information. She ignored the email, not wanting the info online. Then came a second email. Two days afterwards, I got another email saying, oh, we are updated for you, so you don't have to. And I just thought, what? <laughs> At first, PayPal told her it had a right to her card information as part of an updating program. Financial institutions can give customers new credit card information to businesses, and that includes account numbers and expiry dates. It's meant as a convenience. Customers are automatically opted in, whether they know it or not, and the details are often buried in those user agreements. This privacy advocate says banks need to be more clear about what they're doing. They can't just assume you're okay with them sh sharing your new credit information. After GoPublic started asking questions about Ancuna's case, the story changed. PayPal said it shouldn't have had her information at all, saying Visa debit cards aren't part of the updating program, only credit cards are. Who shared the information and why? None of the three companies could or would explain. What we need is people to become aware of this. The merchants who get the automatic updates pay for the service. This cybersecurity expert wonders if financial institutions should be making money by selling customers' information. Banks make a business out of information sharing. They actually have services, Visa, MasterCard, and they are paid to share that information. I'm capable of putting in my information online if I need to. 
it's not a hassle for me, so I definitely would like the option. We went back and forth on email with the companies, and TD maintains it didn't give the information to PayPal, referring us to Visa. Visa says it didn't do it either, and we should put our questions to PayPal. PayPal isn't answering further questions, citing confidentiality, even though Ancona waived confidentiality in order to allow the company to answer GoPublic's questions. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Well, a new era in politics for Ukraine tonight, and possibly its relationship with Russia has begun with the election of a new Ukrainian president. Vladimir Zelensky is a former TV comic with no political experience. And as the CBC's Chris Brown reports, many are still unsure what to expect from the newly elected rookie leader. Well, Ukrainians have been reacting to the election of a comedian as their new president. And one striking observation from talking to people as we have at this Kiev park is that even though Zelensky won with over 73% of the vote, that's an overwhelming mandate, the reaction, in fact, has been very subdued. People have told us, yes, while they're glad that an oligarch, Petro Poroshenko, is no longer running the country, perhaps others uh, will get rich rather than just the rich getting richer in Ukraine. There's also a lot of concern about, for example, the war going on uh, in the east between the Ukrainian government and Russian-backed rebels. Canada has had a big role monitoring this election. We've had over 160 people here headed by Lloyd Axworthy, the former cabinet minister, and today he reported back and said this election was run fairly. The 2019 presidential election has met the international standards for democratic elections. The re results reflect the will of the Ukrainian people, which is all the more remar remarkable given that the election took place in the context of an ongoing foreign aggression by Russia. A lot of people are wondering how is the Russian government going to react? Well, today the only reaction from the Kremlin has been to in fact question the legitimacy of Zelensky's win, saying that more than three million Ukrainians living in Russia were denied the chance to vote. While many world leaders, including Canada's Justin Trudeau, have already sent their congratulations to the new Ukrainian president, there's been no word from Russia's Vladimir Putin. Chris Brown, CBC News in Kiev. Hundreds of homes evacuated in Quebec and New Brunswick. Coming up, rising floodwaters have residents on alert.
to Quebec now, where despite some much needed sunshine today, it's not smooth sailing yet for the province. It's just a break ahead of more rain as they prepare for more flooding. Hard to believe, but this house is not flooded. So far, hundreds of sandbags, three pumps in the yard, and three more inside are keeping Eric Martinez's house dry. But he didn't do it alone. Well, we had so much help, so much help. There's, you know, volunteers from Facebook, people I've never met before. They're just coming here, short boots, just soaking wet, probably going home and getting sick just to help people out. You know, it's really uh, warming, heartwarming. Some of that help came from a group called West Island Flood Volunteers. It started during the record flooding two years ago and quickly matches helpers with those in urgent need. When they have somewhere that they need help, they post the address or area that they need help. So we just keep on top of that and watch and go wherever they need us. It's just one example of a market improvement in crisis preparation this time around. Even here in Rigo, one of the hardest hit areas in the province, you can see evidence of advanced planning. Roger Lachance says water levels are going up in his area, but he's feeling positive. I got about another 18 inches before I hit the, uh, get into the house, uh, for the floor of the house. So, uh, so far so good. We just got to hang on one more day. The province now says, with the exception of a few areas, this year's flooding won't be as bad as 2017. But it will take a long time for water levels to recede. Until they do, people like Eric Martinez will keep up the battle with a little help from their friends. Simon Nakaneshny, CBC News, Pierre Font, Quebec. Meantime, in New Brunswick, flood water levels have peaked in Fredericton, but in other towns, the waters are still rising. The province's emergency measures director has some advice for those unsure whether to stay or leave. If they have any doubt in their mind about their ability to uh, remain safe in their homes, it's probably the best thing to, uh, to err on the side of caution. 120 soldiers have been deployed across the province. They're packing sandbags and doing door-to-door -door wellness checks. So far, 73 homes have been evacuated, nearly 200 people displaced, and at least 35 roads are fully or partially closed. Dealing with a lot of water back there. Mm -hmm. Brett is back with us, and uh, it's certainly not going to get better anytime soon. I know. I really do wish I had better news here, but uh, the weather is just simply not cooperating for those people out east. Um, we have a lot of rain on tap, and then also these very mild temperatures are really contributing to a significant melt. Let's take a look at this right now. This is a precipitation forecast map that I put together for you uh, to show what the situation is like across the east. So you're going to notice two separate systems here. There's one presently affecting the Maritimes, and one coming to Quebec back over the next little while. And when you combine this with the fact that we've got really mild temperatures expected throughout the day on Tuesday, this is just a bad situation to be in. So again, rapid melt plus a lot of rain is only going to be exacerbating the flood situation across the region. Now a bit closer to home, because we do still want to care about what's going on on the local side of things, it's not all that much. We have a bit of a dreary day today. We had a little bit of rain to start off our day. And when we consider what's going to be happening over the next little while, temperatures are actually Actually going to be bouncing right back towards seasonal. So for Vancouver, toward Burnaby, New West, Surrey, right around that 13 or 14 degree mark. Now expect a few showers potentially first thing into the morning. But aside from that, it's not going to be that much of a rain story at all. And in fact, I'm very happy to show you that for the middle of the week, we really are only looking at clear skies for the most part. You could expect maybe a few clouds in some of the valleys first thing in the morning. But in general, widespread across the province, we're looking at fairly high pressure conditions. Now, in terms of our five day forecast here, I think think you're going to like what you're going to see here. As I mentioned, first thing Tuesday morning, we have a few of those showers expected, but look at that. Wednesday straight through till the end of the weekend, or rather end of the work week, we've got temperatures right around seasonal and quite a lot of sun to be expected in that period of time. Well, we'll take that. That looks pretty good. Yeah. And Happy apart to help. <laughs> thank you. And apart from today, uh, the long weekend was delightful. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned because I was able to get out there and enjoy it, and I hope everyone else could as well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news right here at 11 o'clock with Dan Burrett after the National. Have a good night.